Hello, this is Dr. Caitlin Kite from the Academic Development Team, and this session is going to walk you through some ideas associated with public engagement. We're going to think about who the public are and why you might engage with them, and then give some practical hands-on experience with interacting more specifically with the media, who often are a gateway to the public. Now this session builds on previous sessions looking at basics of communication and of outreach and thinking about how those things associate with your own context. And so hopefully you can draw on that information and apply it here. So if you haven't already looked through those, I would suggest that you work your way through them now. This session also comes before another one that looks at multimedia outreach and communication. And that will again build on this one. So there might be some things here that you're expecting that you don't find. And that's because they will either be in that previous um, selection of sessions or in the one to follow. So hopefully this one is the one that you're after right now, thinking about who the public are and how you can get involved with them, especially working with the media. So assuming that you're in the right place, let's begin. I'd like to start by asking you who you think of as the public. So picture in your mind for your particular context for the sort of communication that you want to do, who are the public? Picture someone from the public in your mind's eye. Is that just one type of person or are there many different types of people? If there are many different types of people, how many different types of people? And what sort of characteristics are you using to define those groups? So as you're picturing all these different people, are you categorizing them based on their level of education, their age, their location, their profession, something else? There is no one size fits all answer. And that's the whole point. Hopefully, you will have started off with at least one group and then realized as you thought about it and as I walk through some of those questions, there are actually other people that qualify to you as being in the public. This is a list that I came up with. It's probably not exhaustive, but it, it just shows the different sorts of public audience that I've interacted with over the years. And this is a lot of different people that are all in the public. And sometimes these roles obviously are overlapping. So there are people who, for example, have families and have children um, who are in the schools, but who also have professional jobs as lawmakers or as academics. And so they might be looking at anything that I produce and listening to any of my communication through multiple different lenses at, at a single time. And that's always worth considering. We use the term public engagement in actually kind of a confusing way because we basically put everything under this one umbrella when we're thinking about all these different types of people. And that often makes it really confusing if you're thinking about planning something, if you're seeking funding for something, if you're trying to collaborate with people and get a project off the ground. You need to be really clear about these things. And for your target audience and for your target goal, which would be, again, decided on a project-by-project project basis, you will need to really be sure that you know who it is you're thinking of and who it is you're speaking to, which of these groups, whether it's one of them or many of them. And this, hopefully, will sound sort of familiar because it does draw on some of the concepts that we talked about in that very first session on um, communication basics and thinking about the importance of your audience and the environment in which you're going to be reaching them. I now would like to further ask you a question about why we care about engaging with the people in the public. So why do we care about having this sort of conversation with them? And I would say that engagement is a conversation. It's not necessarily just a one-way street. Again, referring to that first session on communication, Communication always is a cyclical process where you start a conversation, you put a message out there, and then something comes back to you. So sometimes it's going to be more obvious that that's a conversation and you're going to get an immediate response. Other times you might be thinking of something more like teaching or outreach where the response is simply uh, how happy someone is, how much they enjoy it, whether they've learned something, and you're not necessarily going to get firm data right back from someone right then. But regardless, you're doing some sort of research communication then. And probably because you are taking this course, you're interested in communication, you might take it for granted that this is relevant, 
there are some value to these sorts of things, but it's really good to articulate what you can achieve and why you personally care about this and why other people might and what else you might be able to look into doing. So to invite you to have that thought process and to think about your own values and your own goals, I have set up a Padlet. And the Padlet has four different categories on it. And those categories are drawn from some research by an academic named Mark Kerrigan. And he wrote a book a few years ago, which has recently come out in a second version, that's about social media use in academics. And although he's thinking about specifically social media use, which in his case also does involve blogging and not just things like Twitter or Facebook, his discussion about why we do this sort of outreach and this sort of communication is actually quite broadly applicable. So I've taken his four categories, which are engagement, building and maintaining your network, publicizing your work, and managing information. So for each of those broad categories, go and add as many different formats and goals and options as you can think of, things that would fall within those categories and fall under those umbrellas of things that would be qualified as engagement, maintaining your networks, publicizing your work, and information management. And hopefully this will start to give you a sense of why it is that we care about research communication. When you have finished doing that, you can return here and I will pull up a screen to show you all the ideas that have been suggested uh, both by Mark and also by previous participants of uh, the face-to-face -face version of this course. Okay, so hopefully you've been to the Padlet and you've suggested your ideas. Now I'm going to show you the cheat sheet of the sorts of things that previous participants have thought of, and also what Mark Kerrigan himself, the author who came up with these four categories, uh, listed as suggestions. Here you can see that there are quite a few options under each, and I've also added a fifth category, which is that I do think that research communication is fun. Most people find it really enjoyable, and that's why we do often get sucked into spending so many hours on Twitter or recording videos or whatever the format might be for us. And I think it's, it's good to not lose sight of how fun it can be because that often can give you the energy that you need and the focus that you need because it's not easy necessarily to do all of these things. So you can see that there are quite a few options here. Uh, under engagement, there are discussions of how you might be doing teaching, you might be doing citizen science, for example, you might be requesting advice from people, so that's more of a direct conversation. You might be responding to current events. Um, so for example, if there is a pandemic going on and people are scared about how the disease works and whether they might catch it, if that's your area of expertise, you might go out and provide an infographic that provides more intelligence around this issue. So engagement is one broad category that really is just kind of giving your information and perhaps receiving some information on that topic. Then there is the idea of building and maintaining your network. And this is much more about your own professional achievement and progression. So how can you find collaborators? How can you make partnerships? Can you get volunteers for your studies? Can you get people to come to your events that you're holding? Can you um, pitch yourself as someone who might do a job for someone and see if you can get anyone to hire you for something and so on. So this is all about making connections with people, having yourself introduced to those people and, and perhaps seeking to get other people to introduce themselves to you. The next category is publicizing your work. And here there's a lot of conversation around how you can share your academic publications, so the articles that you have published in journals, and perhaps also if you have previous journal articles and you've just published a new one, you might try to piggyback on and make people aware of your older work as well. If there are paywall issues, you might be finding ways to give your, um, your work out to people so they don't have to worry about those. Something that a lot of people are worried about, especially in working with the media, and we'll come to this later, is whether they're going to be critiqued whether someone's going to misunderstand their work and then that's going to be publicized incorrectly. So this would allow you a way to address that more directly. So if you have a web page, for example, or a Twitter account, you're able to in real time respond to those sorts of things. So all of this effectively just helps to make you visible and your work visible, your lab group visible, whatever is the appropriate level for you. 
And finally, we've got information management. And I think this is a category that a lot of people aren't really familiar with. But there are some great success stories out there about how you can provide uh, basically a curation service to the world or take advantage of someone else's and, and collaborate and contribute. So this is something like, for example, a shared Google spreadsheet where you might be collecting reports of, of sightings of things or experiences of things or information on a topic that you're interested in. And maybe that's because you want to study it, maybe because you're just curious, you're trying to make connections with other people. So this could be something that's plugged into some of these other goals as well. Uh, I actually have a friend who created a spreadsheet where scientists could share information about animal behaviors of the, of the animals that they'd studied. And this was purely just because people were curious, they thought it was funny, they wanted to have a laugh. And actually out of that massive spreadsheet there were lots of really good stories and she ended up writing a book. And she and her co-authors thanked everyone that contributed, and she's now turned that into a series of three books. And she did all of that while she was a PhD student, and it was all initiated on Twitter. So this is just to show that this can be really serious stuff, so it might be all about um, creating a, a public database of images or of uh, plans for 3D printing or something like that, or it could be quite frivolous and just really fun and something that would entertain the public. So this just gives you a sense of all the different sorts of categories that your outreach, that your communication might fall within. And it's really good to be aware of these options because they might be of interest to you. You might want to pursue them in the future if you haven't already thought of them. You might not care about any of them, but actually it's good to know that these things happen because at some point it might be relevant to you professionally to join in with someone on this work or to, to take advantage. Uh, of this sort of thing that other people are interested in engaging with in, in your audience. I now want to shift gears a little bit and move on to thinking about how if you were to actually do some of these things and try to spread the word about them and connect with your potential audiences, you might be able to work with the media in order to further your goals. So working with the media is not necessarily something that everyone is interested in. And what I've done, therefore, is to create a video that you can go watch on the side if this is something that you'd like to know more about. And you might watch the whole video all the way through, or you might just um, go to the bits that address the particular topics that you're most interested in. This video is also interactive, so it will ask you some questions and invite you to take part in some activities so you won't just be sitting there watching a film the whole time. This is something that I put together with a colleague in the press office at the University of Exeter. So it provides you some information from the point of view of someone who has done the journalism side of things and also someone who has done the science communication side of things. So hopefully that's kind of a nice dual approach that will give you some real world expertise. It looks at things like how you consider your audience, how the news cycle works, how journalists approach scientists and how scientists can approach journalists, how you would put together a press release, and how you would make your way through uh, an interview with someone if you did get picked up and, and needed to answer some questions. So it's all really about pitching your work in the appropriate way and navigating that relationship with the media in order to get the most out of that. So if this is something that you are interested in, I would suggest that you go take the time to watch that now. And then when you're ready, you can come back here and there's one task that builds on that. Or if that's not something you've watched, it allows you to build on what we've already covered in the session so far. So the task that I'd now like to introduce to finish off this session is a mock interview. Now, unfortunately, because we aren't together, we can't actually hold real interviews live in person, but we can do something that will allow you to kind of get that experience nevertheless. And this is an activity that aims to tie together public engagement more generally with media work more specifically. Because, as I've already said, no matter what sort of public engagement you're interested in, chances are there's some point at which you'll engage with the media in order to, for example, advertise or follow up on an event or draw attention to a project that you're launching or announce the outcome of a research paper that you've just published or so on. And when you do this, the, the key is that you have to think both about uh, the conversation that you're having immediately with 
the press, so if you're being interviewed on the BBC, for example, but also the conversation that you're having with your target audience. So let's say that uh, you are talking about a project that you're launching that will involve lots of stakeholders and hopefully you're going to get some volunteers for a project and so on. So even though you're talking to the press, you are also having to make sure that you're saying things in just the right way to capture the interest of the stakeholders and to explain things to, to them and to get those volunteers interested. So this can be challenging because you've got two audiences at least simultaneously. And it's helpful to always approach an interview with talking points written down and right at your fingertips so that you won't get flustered. So I'd like you to start this by summarizing your research or your project, whatever you'd like to talk about in this mock interview, in no more than five bullet points. So this mimics what you would hopefully be doing when you go into an actual interview. When you then go through the interview, or in this case, uh, the role play interview, you can practice coming back to those talking points no matter what. And this is something that you'll recognize because this is what politicians do all the time when they're on the news. They have their talking points and no matter what question they're asked, they always seem to answer something else. And there's actually an art to this because ideally you would come back to your talking points while still answering that original question or at least making people think that you've answered it or giving them a satisfying response of some sort. So you can practice that here. You can then use the interview prompts, which are in a PDF at the end of this, to role play an interview. And I've got one prompt per page, so that way you can scroll through. And that also means that you would be able to do this without looking at any of the questions in advance. And that's what I suggest you do. Don't cheat make it as real as possible and pretend that someone is actually asking you these questions live. Scroll through them in order as well and you might even set a timer to make it more challenging because if you're being interviewed chances are the journalist is not going to wait very long. They don't have much time so they're just going to ask each question rapid fire. Sometimes they follow up other times they just go down the questions that they've got ready for you so you're going to have to be adaptable and be able to respond quickly. If you've got a friend, you could get them to read those questions and interview you live, but hopefully this will kind of give you an opportunity to have an interview experience. And if you're really brave, you can record yourself using video or audio so that you can then play back that experience later and review your performance. And then you can use that mark sheet and the feedback suggestions from the last session to evaluate yourself and see if there's anything that you think that you need to work on. So I'll give you a chance now to pause this video and go do all of that. And when you're ready, you can come back here. So that wraps up this relatively short session on public engagement. And as I said at the beginning, this is something that really starts to bridge the gap between thinking about communication basics and what you need to do specifically in your context, and then the actual act of thinking about creating lots of different things in different media. So that's what we're going to move on to next. And this hopefully gives you a nice progression so you can build up to that little by little. So if you have any questions or comments about this content, you're welcome to get in touch with me at the email address there. Otherwise, when you're ready, you can move on to the next final session about uh, research communication and thinking about creating multimedia outputs.